Right. So today we're moving on to look at banking and uh, macroeconomics and finance. Um, banking has a bit of a bad rep at the moment. It's not uh, generally considered the coolest thing in the world to do. We often have this idea in our heads of a typical banker. He looks a little bit about like, like this dickhead. Um, that's life. Bankers, bankers only exist in two, two, uh, two quite different states. The first is either they're the greatest geniuses ever put on the planet or they're the biggest and most corrupt. That's uh, what right now, obviously, we, 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 think the, uh, we think the latter. We're not particularly impressed with bankers. But it should be remembered that Sean Fitzpatrick, um, who is now a national hate figure, was voted the businessman of the year. Uh, in the mid 2000s, and also the uh, the bank that he ran, Anglo Irish Bank, was considered the best bank in Europe by the markets only uh, a few years ago. <coughs> now we had some very interesting news over the weekend. The first bit of news was that after the European summit, Angela Merkel sat down and had a had a press conference, and she had a press conference with her German. Uh, German national journalists. So the way it works in the European system is you have the big European summit, but you don't give a press conference to every journalist in Europe because that would be completely unwieldy. What happens is you sit down with the Irish journalists. The Irish politicians talk to the Irish journalists and the German politicians talk to the German journalists. So when Angela Merkel was speaking to them, she was saying something to the effect of, please re-elect me now. Yeah? She's coming up for election in less than 12 months' time. And they asked her, in specific reference to Spain, what about the recapitalization of, of legacy debts of banks? And Angela Merkel said, absolutely not. We will not countenance this. Now, clearly, somebody texted an Irish journalist because everybody then went mental for the weekend. They went absolutely crazy. It was a very, very odd weekend because I kept getting calls from journalists going, what's happening? What's happening? Is the debt deal off? Are we screwed? Will you default? Will you get a second program of, of, of assistance? What's going to happen? You know, will my wages be cut? It was this kind of stuff. And it just it shows how delicate the situation is at the moment, but it also shows fundamentally that, that there is a misunderstanding of the problem. The problem that Angela Merkel was, relate, was, was, was discussing was the recapitalization of banks. Ireland's banks are the most capitalized banks in the, in the European Union. We know this because we've already put 100 billion into them. Just to prove I'm not talking uh, out, of, out of another end of me, here, here are the core one tier, tier one ratios for peer European banks. This is from the NTMA. This is for last year. This is for 2011. What you're looking at here is the, the tier one ratio. You, you can think about this as the reserve, okay? The, it's not quite exact, but think about this as the reserve ratio. This is the amount of, of really good, high quality assets that they have to have on their books. In other words, cash that's been pumped into them by government. Notice three things. There's AIB with nearly uh, 18%. There's permanent TSB. There's Bank of Ireland. Look at Danske Bank, RBS, KBC, Intesa, DAB, SAD, BCP. They're all, these are the best banks in Europe. We are overcapitalized because we've already stuffed a bucket load of money into them. It, it says something quite fundamental, quite fundamental about the, uh, about the nature of, of journalism, but also about the nature of our political process. That's something that's very, very obvious. That if you just Google recapitalization plus Ireland plus bank, you get this. This is the National Treasury Management Agency's investor slide. This is the bit that shows, lads, we don't need to pump any more money into our banks. Yeah? It's right there. Look at the provisions. There's 23 billion euros already in the banks for bad debt. That's for, for, for me, Stephen Kinsley, defaulting on my mortgage and saying, I'm not paying you back. You, you have to take a bad debt right down of... 200,000 or whatever, okay? And this is after the transfer of the NAM alone. So what this is telling you is, if, if anything is true, it is that these banks do not need a recapitalization. And yet, for the entire weekend, it was, will Ireland default? Who, are these my feet? What's happening? You know, it was, 
it was very, very, it was weird listening to the whole thing. The discussion of Marion Finucane was incredibly confused. It was, yeah, it was just really odd, okay? Now, this is the most important chart here. Recapitalization costs as a percentage of GDP. So for each, each individual country's crisis, here's how much the banking crisis has cost as a percentage of national output. And you can see a couple of things. The first is that there have been some pretty horrendous ones. Finland, Jamaica, Malaysia, Thailand, Korea, Turkey, Chile, Indonesia. But topping them all by some considerable distance, it's us. Nearly 40% of GDP, and this doesn't include NAMA. Okay? So, what's the problem? There are three problems in Ireland's banks. The first problem are the promissory notes. I'm going to talk to you about those uh, next week. The first problem of the promissory notes, this is 25.1 billion euros worth of cash that Ireland pumped in, shoveled in, to uh, Anglo-Irish Bank. And I'll talk to you about how that was created in a bit of detail later on. The second problem are basically 20 billion, 21 billion euros of shares, effectively, that we bought in these banks. We'd like the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, to buy these off us. The problem is we bought them for 20 billion. Are they worth 20 billion? Hell to the no, they're not worth 20 billion. They're probably worth somewhere between six and eight. So here's the game. Somewhere between eight and 21, the ESM will, will buy those shares off us. That was what freaked everybody out. They, can, they concatenated recapitalization with the transfer of ordinary preference shares. They're two pretty separate things. And uh, there managed to be a massive foo for all about it. And, uh, and there was really no, no need whatsoever. So um, then they issued a statement on sa Sunday saying, no, we said we would examine this debt. The exact statement was, we need to examine this debt. Well, Ireland is a special case. They didn't say they'd solve it. They said, we'll examine it. Now, this is quite an important point. It's quite an important point, folks. Um, I can examine as much as I like. If I'm a doctor and you're, you come to me with something wrong with you, I can examine you. That doesn't mean I'm going to give you antibiotics. I might decide you're a grand. <laughs> Have some vitamin C and a Lemsip and sleep it off. I might decide that. I might decide you need radical surgery, but, I'll, but I, I'm, I can only examine you. I haven't decided anything is going to happen. So there's a big difference. So. What I want to talk to you about today is macroeconomics and finance. And clearly, clearly it's connected and deeply relevant to, to, the, to Ireland today because quite literally nothing else happened this weekend other than people freaking out about a, a, a simple thing that you could check in like 30 seconds. Okay. So here's what I want you to learn. If you, can, you all, can you all take this down for me, please? It's very important. This is the important thing for today. If you get this, you get the rest of it. What is finance? Finance, ideally, is the transfer of funds from savers to investors via, from savers to investors via the uh, banking system. So you've got three different types. You've got financial markets. These are where these guys meet, the bond market, the stock market, etc. Lenders and savers, households, firms, government, and financial actors, banks and financial intermediaries. We've already seen the balance sheets of banks, households, firms, governments, central banks, and financial intermediaries. So you already have a sense in your notes of what this stuff looks like, okay? The, the important thing here is to note that the blue lines connecting all this is money. Yeah? What connects these people is the transfer of capital between them. I am a saver. I save money. I save money in a couple of ways. One is my pension. Another is the, um, uh, the savings that I have for my, my children's education. And the third thing is just like a general savings pot, which takes a couple of hundred euros a month. Okay? Um, so I save in three different ways. And I do that through three different things. The first is a stupid deposit account, which literally gives money to a bank for a very, very, very low interest rate. I don't even know what it is. It's so small. The second is a pension scheme where, where I give the money to somebody to invest for me. And the third is a very special um, high yield um, 
saving account um, that's, that's designed to pay out in 10 years' time, uh, which I presume has some bonds and stuff like that. Because my son is six, and he's going to college when he's 16, anywhere except UL, because he needs to leave. And the other children, they need to leave right after that, too. And uh, I've been telling them that since they were, you know, born. So that's fine. And so they all understand that. So, uh, yeah. The households are savers and lenders. The firms are savers and lenders. The government is a saver and a lender. It's un it, I don't think people realize the government controls about 6 billion euros worth of savings in the National Pension Reserve Fund. Yes, there's still some money in that thing. And um, it, it invests it. Now, it turns out that the people it invested this money with are idiots. They would have made more money in an Ulster, in an Ulster Bank current account than uh, the, with the people who, who manage the 6 billion euros. So it's, it, that's a, been a bit of an institutional failure, but nonetheless, it's there. What these guys do is transfer money around. Now, note two things. Why are households saving? They're saving for three reasons. One <coughs> is because they, don't, they can't consume enough. That's normally not the problem. Two, two they're saving to consume later. So, for example, in the kids' education, I know there's going to be full fees in 10 years' time. You'd have to be a moron not to realize it. So... I'm going to save for it. The third is, I know I'm going to get old. I know I am old. So uh, I, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to have to make provision for that. So three different ways of saving. One is just saving, uh, saving instead of consumption. The second is uh, saving to smooth consumption. So I know it's going to cost me a lot of money to put my kids through third level later. And the third is saving to defray the costs of uh, old age. Who, who do I save with? I save with banks. Or and financial intermediaries of a, a, a pension company. Okay, um, <clears throat> you could also view, by the way, life insurance. If you have life insurance, uh, when you get kids, you more or less have to have life insurance. Or when you have a mortgage, you get life insurance, um, and that's also a, a, a form of saving in a sense. Um, the firms they will save and invest, and the government. What happens is your savings turn into somebody else's investment, and what the vehicle by which this happens are financial actors. Banks transform saving into investment. That's what they do. And they make money as the saving becomes investment and when it comes back. And you saw that in like week two or week three about the, the money creation process and fractional reserve banking and so forth. Right, so that's a nice little picture. Along the way, another loop has been created. And here's the loop. Here's what it looks like. The loop, the loop looks like this. Banks sell stuff to banks. Okay, so this is very socially useful. It's extremely socially useful. Without credit, firms can't su su survive. Without credit, um, most of the economic growth that we've seen in the last couple of years wouldn't have been activated. But there's another type, which is banks selling and lending to each other simply to increase liquidity or to make money ga through gambling. Okay. And this, while this is socially useful in that it activates real-world economic activity, this is just useless. It transfers money between financial intermediaries and has no realizable economic impact. It's not socially useful. We don't need it. None of you here, and I mean none of you, would notice it if it weren't there because it doesn't impact your lives. It's not a feature of the real economy. It's a feature of the financial economy. And when the financial economy goes bang, then you have real economic impact. And you can model that and understand it with the ISLM model we studied last week. If you understand the ISLM model, as, if, as I showed it to you last week, you can understand what happens when there's a collapse in lending. Just change the slope of the LM curve. Okay. So what is finance for? Right. There are a couple of things. The first is fundamental finance helps savers and lenders meet. It increases liquidity in the system simply because that's the job of the bank. The bank, in pursuing its profit motive, actually increases the amount of liquidity, in other words, the amount of money in the system. Okay? Here's a big one. You, may, you, might not, you might not believe this. It's supposed to. Please underline this if you've got these notes. It's supposed to decrease systemic risk through, through diversification. But in fact, in fact, it may well be that it increases systemic risk through connection. So it may be that it increases systemic risk through connection. All the banks are so wrapped in on one another 
that any explosion in one of the banks ripples through into all the others, causing a, a, a systemic crash. Now, that's fundamental finance. Everything else, everything else is gambling, right? It's just gambling. And you would never think to claim that you putting a monkey on a horse for Cheltenham was systemically important and important for the health of the nation. You would never, ever say that because that would be mad. But these guys, what these guys are saying to us is that, oh yeah, no, no, what I do is absolutely necessary to support the development of the nation. Even though I transfer, you know, 100 million euros into Ireland on Tuesday the 12th and transferred it out on Wednesday the 13th. That's important to Ireland for some reason. It sat in a bank account um, for some particular reason. That's, that's it. It's not true. So, there is an important interaction between the scale of finance and the rate of growth. You've already seen this. I've shown it to you. Um, in, that, in the model of firm growth, the difference between growth maximizing and profit maximizing firms, you've seen a model where there is an important interaction between the scale of finance and the rate of growth. Now, this important interaction is something that very few courses model, and it's, I, think it's, I think it's very valu valuable for you to know. Now, um, hands up here who's ever looked at uh, buying a car in the north of Ireland. Yeah, quite a few people, actually. Okay, so um, one of the reasons that you might do that is because cars are so much cheaper up there. They're really, really cheap. Um, if you, if you, let's just say off the top of my head, you'd like to buy a 2007 Citroen C4 with a 1.6 litre HPV engine, um, less than 80,000 kilometres on the clock, seven seater, um, and uh, you would like, just off the top of my head, for the crack, and you'd like to buy it for in Ireland or, or, or uh, the, well, let us just bracket it, the United Kingdom. If you buy it in Ireland, it's going to be 13,000 euros. If you buy it in the United Kingdom, changing the um, exchange rate, it's 9,000 euros. I'm an economist. I have a PhD in economics. I can pay 13,000 or 9,000. It's the same car. It's like literally 200 miles up the road. Very good. So then I have to pay an import fee. There's a thing called VRT. It stands for Vehicle Registration Tax. And, v and the VRT is... Does anyone know what the VRT on a 2007 or up 1.6 litre Citroen C4? Preferably gold, apparently, according to my wife. But uh, let me know what that is. Interestingly enough, it's almost exactly four grand. Does anybody know how this is calculated? How the VRT is calculated? It's a very interesting system. On the car's value to where? Where, which value? The Irish value. So here's what they do. <laughs> you buy your car for a euro up the north. Like literally, if you get some nutter to send it to you for a euro, you go up there, hello, pay a euro, get your docket, drive the car back down. You go into the VRT office and they say, hello, Mr. Kinsler, how are you? You say, I'm very fine. I've just bought a car for a euro. And they go, great. That'll be 12,999 euros in VRT. And you go, why? And they said, because it, it has to match. They balance it. They artificially balance the amount. So there's no point in you rocking up and doing that. Why do they do it like this? Why is it done like this and no other way? Why don't they just go, it's 20% or like 10%? They change the VRT based on the price of the car that day. And you've got like, oh, by the way, you've got a day to pay it. You have to pay it more or less that day. Like, you... you, you more or less have to rock up to the, to the motor tax office with the money in your pocket. So how does that work? They want to keep the money in the Irish economy. What's that an example of? Protectionism. Very good. Very good. Um, but why, 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 why wouldn't, wouldn't the government be happier if the price of cars went lower? I would be, as the government, I would be happier. I would be happier if the price of cars were lower. Cars are an input to the productive process. They're not like an end in themselves. Some cars are consumption goods. You know these, these dudes with the classic cars and all that? That's consumption. Um, my car is, is an investment. I, I, or, well, no, actually, no, it's a consumption good. I'm consuming my car as I drive my children around the place. 
Um, for a business, it's an input. It's an investment, right? You need, if you're a plumber, you need a van. Simple as that. There's n <laughs> no plumber cycles from job to job, yeah? Maybe there's one, but uh, you need it. So why don't you just make the cost of these inputs lower? Just like put it, but I understand the, the government wants to tax blinking. Like if, if, if the go governments love taxing people, so why do, I mean, I, ta I, I mean, I get that. If I was the government, I'd be like, how do you tax breathing? You know, that would be a genuinely, I, I want to tax texts. I want, a, I want a special program to tax people's texts and tax you extra if you, if you don't spell properly. It's a great idea, isn't it, folks? We'd, we'd make millions. Forget your financial transactions tax. It would be brilliant. Because you could imagine, hello, it is Stephen. Would you like to go to the cinema tonight? Semicolon. <laughs> you know, it'd be brilliant. Anyway, uh, arbitrage, Stephen. Focus. So, the point here is that what they do is they the, the government in this instance stops arbitrage. Arbitrage is the riskless moving of profit from one system to another. Yeah? I could, if, if, if it were the case that there was only, let's say, a 10% change, if, if the tax were 10% of the difference, right? Let's say the, the Irish car is 13 grand, the, um, the uh, UK car is 5 grand, right? But there's a 10% or a 20% uh, tax. The 20% tax increases the price of the car to 6 grand, doesn't it? Yeah? So from 5 grand to 6 grand. There's still a massive price differential. Because the car, the Irish car is 13 grand, the UK car, including the tax, is now six grand. So I can make seven grand if I drive the car down and sell it for anything less than 13,000. I can make a really good profit on this car, can't I? A great profit, a riskless profit, because I know at least one person who wants to buy it. Me, happy days. What would the effect of that be on the domestic car sales industry in Ireland? It, nobody would buy a car unless the price of Irish cars went down. So the price of Irish cars would fall very, very rapidly. I would assume probably in the case of days, would fall very rapidly. Most car dealerships would go out of business. Um, I mean, you've you got to remember, we're selling identical products here. It's not like there's a British Citroen C4 and an Irish Citroen. They're identical products, okay? They're all high quality. There's no issue about that. The prices drop in Ireland until the profits that you can make from moving the car across the border are gone. Yeah? That's what would happen. And, and that is a great example of arbitrage. Yeah? If an arbitrage profit exists, the moment it is actually noticed, competition moves to close it off. Yeah? So some people would make a huge amount of money in the first kind of couple of weeks of this because they'd be driving Citroen C4s down sort of you know, the, the motorways will be just full of Citroen C4s as people, you know, buy them up. They just buy them because they're really cheap and they're great cars, whatever. And, uh, yeah, that's great. And so you've got happy economists, full car full of kids, it's all good. Now, the efficient markets hypothesis, which is, by the way, a very nice idea. However, it's been killed by a series of ugly little facts. Um, it turns out to be, it's a nice idea, it's empirically falsified, it's one of the few things in economics that we think is a good idea but turns out not to be true. Um, the uh, simple idea is that it's very hard to beat the market. Yeah, it's very hard to beat the market. So, the idea is, is be best, expressed, best expressed in this notion of currency exchange. So, you can change the US dollar in terms of euros and the euro in terms of yen and the US dollar in terms of yen. Okay? If you knew that the US dollar in terms of euros was overpriced. Overpriced. Yeah. Or no, even better. Let's say it's, yeah, well, let's say it's overpriced. If, we, if this was overpriced, you could buy cheap euros in terms of yen, transfer to transfer dollars in terms of yen, and make a killing. Yeah? You could make an absolute killing. If you knew right now that there was some riskless profit opportunity. How much should you invest in this riskless profit opportunity? Pardon? Everything. 
define everything. Everything. If you knew, if you knew that it was riskless and you knew that it was an arbitrage opportunity, the first thing you've got to do is tell no one, right? Because if you tell anybody, they'll try to do the same thing. Competition will destroy it. You should sell your house, sell your car, mortgage your children's kidneys, and go straight in there. Why? Because it's riskless. You're going to make a, you're going to, you're going to make an incredible amount of money. Yeah, an incredible amount of money. In fact, you're going to make as much money as you put in. You'll make it times some some percentage. So, if you spot a true opportunity, here, remember, remember this moment, folks. If you spot a true opportunity, first things first, tell no one. Tell no one. Because this is all about information. If you have information and the other people don't, you're, you're in much better shape than they are. The second thing is, what would you do? What should you do? You should pump as much of your wealth into it as you can because you're going to get a massive return. Of course, how do you know it's an arbitrage opportunity beforehand? How do you know it's truly riskless? You don't. So I don't know. Have you ever been to the horses and you, you hear some? Oh, you know, you know, Mickey Finn there. You know, and so, some horse with three legs, no tail. You know, being 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 ridden by a drunken seven foot jockey like, you know, and uh, apparently, oh, he's a sure thing. He's a sure thing. And you're being told this. Would you really put your house on it? Depends on your coefficient of risk aversion, I suppose. I certainly wouldn't. Okay. Pardon? Very good. It's a sure thing. Nobody would talk about it. Or if they did, you would... No, no, but you would have to know something about them, right? You would have to know, like... You would have to be their brother or your best friend. You know, you would have to be... You, you wouldn't just meet them in the public and go, Hi, how's it going? My name's Stephen, by the way. By, you know, Stephen's nag at 200 to 1 on. Like, that's... End. Okay. So there's another question, another important question, which is, does finance help development? Does it help the economy develop? I mean, no. We're implicitly assuming that more loans are like better, right? That if you can get credit, that's a good thing. But clearly, it's not a good thing. It's not of itself a good thing that we can all get credit. Because some of us are really, really stupid. Look around you. Not now, but look around you in your life. The world is full of idiots. Yeah? I'm not saying you're idiots. You're not. You're very smart people. That's why you're here. But the world is full of idiots. It's full of people who bought houses when they were way too expensive just because they could. Yeah? That's not smart. The world is full of idiots. And if you give credit to these idiots, you create a bubble. Be careful. Or you could be one of those idiots. I don't know. So you all look really clever. Maybe there's something about you that's just not right. I'm not sure. So, does finance help development? Clearly, it does help development. You're sitting in a building which was designed and built on the back of German and French taxpayers' money. That's basically where the money to build this building came from. Okay? So it does help development in that sense. Well, okay, the answer, the answer in the literature is yes and no. Um, Easterly and Levine in 2001 said, actually, no, it doesn't help. They said, no, uh, factor accumulation does not, doesn't help cause growth. Okay? Uh, Finance to help factor accumulation doesn't drive growth. That's what they said. Study of a hundred different countries, finance doesn't help. If you, you need a little bit, but not more than that. Rajan and Zingales in 98 said yes. Absolutely, 100% finance helps, and it helps good firms grow. That's why they studied the, the transmission channel uh, for firms, and they found that yes, it does indeed help them grow. Levine in 2010 said, no, actually, it's quite harmful. Um, and Honohan, 2004, unfortunately, Honohan has, has disappeared into uh, uh, obscurity. But um, he said, actually, no, they're poorly understood. Honohan, um, obviously, he didn't disappear into obscurity. He's now the central bank governor. But he was in the World Bank for many years. He's visited something like 100 countries in his life. Um, and he says, well, look, finance development are very poorly understood. And we don't understand how they work for poverty reduction, okay? Financial debt is negatively correlated with poverty. So financial debt is how many types of instrument are regularly transacted in your economy, yeah? If you're the type of economy that has, you know, CDOs and CDO squared and all sorts of stuff um, being transmitted through your economy, you're probably pretty well 
uh, uh, you're probably pretty well um, diversified. You're probably pretty pretty advanced. If you don't, if you've got basically car loans and mortgages, you're probably not that dumb. So here's how financial markets work. Here's the idea. The idea here is that the market balances supply and demand for a profit. That's the big one. Okay. So buyers here will issue buy orders. So I want to buy 200,000 euros worth of Bank of Ireland at 15 cent all the way down to zero, but do not buy it if it goes up to 16 cents. Okay? That's called a limit order buy. It's a limit because there's only a certain amount of which, a, a, a level of up to which I'll buy, and it's a limit order only market. So these are the only types of orders that I'll, I'll accept. So these are the types of buy orders. You never actually buy a share. No one in this room has ever bought a share. You go to an intermediary like a stockbroker and you say, buy me a share. And he doesn't go, yeah, sure, I'll buy it. By the way, I came back, the share was 500 euros. He only wanted to spend a tenner. That's not what happens. What happens is you say, I want to buy this between 10 euros and 15 euros a share. You know, if you get it for 12.50, I'll be pretty happy. And that's what your broker does. He executes that trade for you. There are winners and then there are losers. The whole point about this is somebody is selling you something. If somebody was selling you Bank of Ireland in like 2008, they were selling this thing for you know 15 euros. It's now worth 10 cent. You were a sucker. You were well on your way to being a sucker. Does anybody know the mathematical definition of being a sucker? Have I shown you this already? Okay. Does that, do, many of you will have read Fool by Randomness. Some of you are tweeting about your disgust with the book reading, which is quite funny actually. But many of you will read it, have read Fool by Randomness. And uh, I'm enjoying your pain on Twitter, so please, you know, uh, put it out there. You're a turkey. You're a turkey. And you're born at some time to eat. And when you're born, you're given grain to eat, or whatever it is turkeys eat. Do turkeys eat like rats, whatever they eat. You're given loads of grain and corn on the cob and Mars bars, whatever you want. Anyway, this is a, your percentage change. God. This is a percentage change in your weight, okay? So when you're born, your weight, your weight goes like this. Because you just keep getting bigger and they keep, you know, feeding you food. It's all good. Happy days. Yeah, great. And then you think, because <coughs> you're an econometrically trained turkey, you think, well, what if I do a forecast? My weight's just going to keep going like this, isn't it? It's all good. Except there's some vital piece of information that you don't know. Which is what? Christmas. Here's Christmas. Here's the percentage change in your growth rate. You are now dead because you are a turkey who has, been, who has had his neck wrong. So, here's how not to be a sucker. You, the turkey is a sucker because he believes his past behavior is a guide to future behavior. He doesn't, he doesn't look, out, look around and go, what's happening to the older turkeys around me? They seem to be going off for a bit of an hour walk and not coming back. Yeah? The turkey should have expanded his information set. And then what, he, what, what would he have done? What? Eat less. Become a scrawny turkey. You still probably get killed, but at least you'll, be, you'll have some sort of Freudian satisfaction in, uh, in beating everybody up. You, 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 you stop yourself from becoming a turkey by not accepting past, past performance as the only guide. Expand your information set. Okay? So, winners and losers. And in the middle is the regulator, regulator or the central bank. So now, remember discounting. You have to think about this in terms of what your expected future cash flow looks like. You've all seen this many times before, and I know you're talking about this in finance with Ferg as well. Um, you've seen this. Recall, if an economy grows at 2% a year, okay, then each time it grows by 2%, it's compounding. Yeah? It, national income will double in 35 years. It's the rule of 70. You reverse this for future discounting amounts. Okay. Bond markets. Everybody cares about the bond market. My granny cares about the bond market. Everybody cares about the bond market. I'm going to show you the bond market in a second. The government of Ireland is the issuer of the bond. There's some amount 
let's say 10 euro, 100 euros, 100 million it wants to get rid of. There's a specified interest rate to the issuer, pay to the issuer yearly, okay? And this is known as the coupon, it's called 5%. There's a date of maturity, five years, okay? And it works. The important thing about the bond market is that this is all you need to know. If you know this, you now understand the bond market. Congratulations and move on. We have a tendency in Ireland to, re to, to, to sort of give the markets, especially if you listen to the radio, well, the markets were un un unhappy today, like they're these sort of stentorian gods. The markets are not godlike. They're 26-year-old Egypts. Most of the time, they buy Irish government debt. Half of them can't locate Ireland on a map. Don't worry about them. But if you, knew, if you know this, you understand bonds. So, bond prices are affected by interest rates. The price of the bond depends on the interest rate. If the bond is paying 100 euros out after the end of one year, then it's worth 100 divided by 1 plus R over 1. If the interest rate is 5%, the bond is worth 95.2. If the interest rate is 10%, the bond is worth 90.9. .9. What this is telling you and you should all underline this, is that the price of the bond varies inversely with the interest rate. Okay? It varies inversely. Okay? Consider a bond that pays a fixed coupon A forever. The price of the bond is going to be A over R, which is just the sum of an infinite geometric series. Again, you might go, this is all a little bit abstract, Stephen. Oh, no, it's not, folks. If we don't issue ne some bonds next year, some of you might get kicked out of college. And you go, oh, Stephen's only making... No, I'm not. I'm really not. What will happen is, if the education budget gets cut to pieces, your registration fees will go up. And uh, my salary will go down. We can assume there will be two things happening. One is slightly less motivated Steve. The other is a lot less students for economics for business next year. So, lots of things affect the value of a bond. Maturity is the big one. Obviously, me handing you my money for two years is different to me handing you my money for 10 years or for 20 years. Big difference, okay? Credit quality, <laughs> who is issuing this thing? Is it the United States? If it's the United States, you know, you do all understand that the new president, if it's President Obama or President Romney, in January, basically the United States runs out of money. Literally runs out of money. It has to default on some of its debt unless they raise the debt ceiling in the US. That said, markets are totally happy to lend the US money at basically zero. Yeah? Greece, not so much. The implied probability of Greek default is about 85%, and they've already defaulted twice. Interest rates really matter. They're fixed, they're floating, they're paid at maturity, whatever. There's lots of different things. The price, I can buy a bond off you, but maybe I want to sell that bond to somebody else. The bond is worth less, obviously, than its, its face value. And bonds that are traded far away from maturity, they trade at interest rates determined by interest rate movements. And this is the important one. This is the thing everybody cares about. So if you're interested in this bond stuff, I really think you should be, folks. You should underline this or write it down. The yield is the, returned, the return earned on the bond. Okay? If the, if the interest rates rise, the yield will fall. That's... That's, that's just it. If you get this, you get, you get it all. You understand how the bond market works. Okay? The return earned on the bond. If the yield is higher, then maybe that's a good thing. Right. Yield curves. They measure perceptions of risk. They plot the interest rate of the bonds over time. So what does the yield curve look like? Well, it looks like this. Hello. Here is the US. You okay. Come on, hurry up. Hurry up. I'm so impatient. This thing is like sending a signal to space, and I'm like, come on. Hurry up. So ungrateful. Yeah. Cool. So here's what you see. This is today, like now. Okay? Look at the coupon. You get no coupon for holding six months US treasuries, no coupon for 12 months, tiny coupon for two years. The, in, the, the nominal interest rate 
right? The, what you get, what you get from the U.S. government for lending them money is nothing. They give you nothing, right? Literally nothing. Their bonds are exactly the same as cash, and people are totally happy to give them the money. Why? Why? If I turned around to you and I said, hi, listen, how are you? How's it going? Can I borrow 100 euros off you now? But I'm not going to give you anything later. I'm going to give you nothing. Like, Would you go, yeah, here's 100 euros. Have fun. If, you're your, if I'm your brother or something, you may be. But... Pardon? They're paying for safety. They're paying for safety. Everybody's worried. Okay? Notice the coupon does actually go up for 30 years. This yoke here is the yield curve. What it does is it plots the different maturities and the different interest rates. Note the shape of the yield curve. It's kind of straight, isn't it? Normally, you would expect it to look like this. This is three, and you would expect it to look like this. But in fact, it looks like this. The difference between what we call normal and today's yield curve is a measure of how people think about the future. How do you think about the future of the US economy? What this is telling you is that the markets say the US economy is going to be grand. That's what this is selling. They're not worried about it at all. Romney is banging on about the deficit. The markets couldn't care less about the deficit. Romney's banging on about, uh, oh, we need to get, thing, get our house in order. The markets clearly couldn't care less. They don't care. If they cared, that thing wouldn't be three, it'd be nine. Yeah? They're telling you that the long term, the markets view the long term health of the US economy as being more or less stable. Okay. More or less. So, anyway, what does the yield curve tell us? It tells us a lot, folks. A lot. Okay? It changes across the business cycle. Sometimes you have what's called an inversion of the yield curve. If you, you say that to your parents tonight, you know, what were you doing? I was studying inversions of the yield curve. You sound really cool, you know? Um, not that cool, obviously. But if you could sound, may, mar, at least, they, at least they may, you might think, they might think that you're doing something. Um, recessions generally have upward sloping yield curves. You saw, you've seen that there, okay? Lower demand for long-term bonds during recessions lowers the price and increases the yield. In contrast, yields on short bonds are pro-cyclical because of monetary policy. So straight up. Okay. Note for the U.S. economy the following. Here is here are the constant maturity rates over the years. Last time, looking at the ISLM model, we saw an, an image of a world where the LM curve looked like this. This is GMP. This is the interest rate. This is the IS curve. This is the LM curve. Okay? And this gave you interest rates. That's fine. But what happens? But, but what happens if you want to, if, if the economy is below equilibrium <coughs> and you want to stimulate it by a monetary policy? You just print a load of cash. Okay? You allow the LM curve to shift. And that gives you your bump it out. That's fine. Print a lot of money. They've done that now four times. Yes. What happens when the interest rate is really low? When it's down here? Effectively zero. Okay? What happens when it's like that? When it's like that, LM3, you're in something called a liquidity trap. A liquidity trap. What is a liquidity trap? A liquidity trap is where there is no difference between your bonds and cash. And so the investors have no, no, uh, your, your monetary policy has no effect on, effect on be investor behavior. The monetary policy has no effect on investor behavior. What can you see? You can see here that at the end of 2010, 2011, we're at incredibly low incredibly low rates for everything. 10, 2, 1 year. Incredibly low. This is a liquidity trap. That's what this is. 
It means that the US monetary policy is useless. Our transitional monetary policy, as I've taught it to you, is useless. That should give you pause, folks. That should make you worry. It should make you worry because if the US doesn't print money and doesn't stimulate its economy, then it won't buy stuff from people like us, meaning you won't have jobs. So that's why you should be worried about this. Bonds matter for the macro economy. They represent borrowing, okay? Especially government and corporate borrowing. And when governments can't borrow, they end up like Ireland today. Um, it's a big worry. What I want to show you finally, <clears throat> what I want to show you finally is Ireland's bond rate. I want to show you a couple of things, actually. Right. So, this is where everybody goes to look at the, the yield on bond. This is the yield. Now, it's not just a regular yield. Note a couple of things. This is a five-year, this is Ireland's five-year bond. This is real time, okay? Um, five-year, it's called the generic bid yield. So, when, you're here, when you hear the nine o'clock news um, and... Sharon Naviolan comes on and says, the yield on Irish debt spiked massively yesterday, or it fell yesterday. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. It's absolutely incorrect. The reason that it's incorrect is because nothing happened. Nothing. No one traded. No one trades Irish debt. If you have Irish government debt, nobody wants to buy it off you. Why? Because everybody's worried that we're going to default. There's one guy that's buying loads of it, though. Does anybody know his name? He was profiled in the New York Times last year. His name, his name is Michael Hassenstab. He's, uh, he's bought about 3 billion euros worth of Irish government debt. He has single-handedly lowered this yield. Yeah, He's bought up here, and it was very risky. He's taken a punt on Ireland to the tune of several billion. Um, we can make him an honorary Irishman like Jack Charlton if, if it all works out. Note a couple of things. First is... This generic bid yield is essentially a survey. So what they do is they ring around, Bloomberg ring around a load of different bond traders and they say, if Ireland issued five-year paper today, what would you buy it for? And the lads go, oh, six, five, two, one, 13. And then they average it. And that's what this is. So this is not the actual bond yield, which is what you get when you auction off bonds or they sell it to one another. This is sort of like a survey. So it's not really perfect. The, way, the only place you get a really good price on bonds is right after an auction. Um, and so we know that the average price of five-year bonds is about 6%. That's what the lads have sold it for. But what I want to show you is, <clears throat> here is uh, November, the twi November the 25th last year. Note the solid drop over time. From very high levels, though, from 10%. Anything above 7, folks, this is important, anything above 7 is you are going to default, basically. It's the market telling you, we're pretty sure you're going to default. You can see it dropping, dropping, dropping. It stabilizes as the new government takes power. And then it increases again for a little period. And then look, this is the, this is the June 29th thing. This is where Kenny and Merkel and all the heads of state get together and go, right, we are going to separate out the banking debt from the government debt. We're going to, this is where the examine phrase comes in. Look at the difference. Overnight, it goes from 6.42 5.31, an enormous drop. You can see it. Look at the size of it. In one day, boom, job done. What this means is, if it turns around that Germany doesn't examine our debt and find it in, net, in need of changing, then what happens is this starts spiking back up again. Right now, it's at 3.44. Is that the very latest data? Yeah, it is. This is today, 3.44. A five year, which is pretty cool. It's really pretty cool. I, I'm, I'm quite impressed by this actually, as a matter of fact, um, which is good. So now, uh, one more thing. No, actually, no, I'll leave it till uh, Thursday. Okay, thank you very much, folks.